All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Joseph, did you want to lead off uh, with yours, or do you want me to go first? What um, what what's the plan, Jamie? Let's synchronize. Sure. So let's uh, have you uh, walk people through a, a detailed explanation of your setup uh, with DNS, DHCP, and vSphere, uh, and then I'll show my automation. So. Um, I can show the installation as it is uh, described in the in the GitHub OKD repo because mm -hmm. I'm using that. Sure, and you don't have to wait for the whole thing. Yeah, we're good, Diane. All right, I'm going to just pop into the other ones. Just um, know that you're recording. You've got about ten people watching you, and take it away. Um, and you don't have to go for six hours. There are I set it up so you could go as long as you wanted, but <laughs> if you go six hours, you're doing good. Um, okay. And you're doing tech support, so uh, that's the other thing. Remind people that you're not doing tech support. You're you're demoing. Take care. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. Um, Ever, you're asking about vSphere. You want uh, workers in different clusters. Can I use API and move a worker after it is created, or should I use UPI? Um, you want to con. You want to share workers over different clusters, or what is your purpose? I, I don't understand the question, to be honest. So I can respond to Larry real quick. Um, so Larry 3X is no longer supported as of May. Um, so you'll want to move over as soon as possible. Um, there are some migration guides available. Uh, on the web, and if you have any particular questions about migration, um, we might be able to handle them, or folks uh, in the event chat um, could handle them uh, as well. But you'll definitely want to move over as soon as possible. And okay, well, while we're waiting for for uh, Everett, why don't you go ahead, Joseph? And uh, oh, here we go. We got a response. Yeah. I don't know. I've never heard of uh, so, this scenario. So uh, are you thinking that, um, so moving the VM to a different vSphere installation and have it work? Um, is this UPI or IPI? So, oh, you're asking. Okay, so um, essentially a worker is um, bound to its... Uh, control plane. Uh, and if you are going to, if you want to use a worker on a different cluster, you basically need to redeploy it. And so that's what the, that's one of the foundations of FCOS, uh, Fedora Core OS, is that when you want to make a change, you basically just redeploy the node. Um, so you would just redeploy the node um, by uh, taking the metadata uh, you could do this via UPI, uh, if you did UPI. Um, take the metadata that was generated in the ignition config file uh, and then um, insert that into the VM and there's a flag you have to set it. I can't think of it off the top of my head. But basically, when you boot up the VM next time, uh, it'll reprovision and make that connection to the other control plane uh, that you want to move it to. Um, so there's really no way to, to um, just you know, point to a different com control plane. Essentially, you'll want to reprovision. I hope that helps. I could show installation of uh, based on the um, OKD repository, maybe the first steps. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and um, then <clears throat> I'll show the automation stuff that sort of simplifies all of that. Okay. So it all starts um, here. So this is the uh, GitHub repository of OKD. Um, don't be confused that you uh, not find any uh, source code in this repository. It's more like a, like a meta repository where we um, mostly it's documentation 
but also the guides here in this uh, guides folder we have currently IPI Azure uh, description and a UPI in the, um, different flavors. I could show you how I start with uh, the vSphere Terraform version. Um, how Does anybody of you use uh, Terraform? Maybe we can discuss that first. Maybe all the time, so that's good. <laughs> It's very good, good decision. Okay, two, okay. I think it's worth two, yeah, three, okay. <laughs> three is a three is a set. Um, I could, I, okay, I will uh, spend a few minutes about uh, that. So the first thing is um, you should clone this uh, repository here. So OKD repository, I've done that in advance. I, I built a cluster an hour ago from that. So this is the repository. I'm in the vSphere Terraform folder. A few days ago, I, um, com I can try to make it bigger. Maybe that helps. Oops, ah, it scrolls away. Uh, give me a second. Maybe like this. I hope, I hope you can see something. So, Jamie, if somebody asks um, anything, maybe you can uh, throw that to me because I can't see the chat. Absolutely. Yep. So, this is the repository. I'm uh, starting from scratch. This is the same you see in the GitHub repository. If you go to Guides, UPI, vSphere Terraform, you will land in this repository here. And if you um, you see, you will see that there is a, a file in the repository that's called Terraform TF was example. I will show you this one. Here it is. And uh, at first you have to fill out the variables. Don't um, don't get frightened. It's uh, yeah, it's nothing special you have here. Uh, your cluster ID, um, your cluster domain. Uh, Mike, I can show you uh, what I built from that. It is here. The, the cluster name is C1. In my example here, the domain is homelab.net. Yeah, and you have to fill that out. I have to find my, put it like this. Then you have to, um, yeah, tell him where the vSphere, vSphere server is, your vSphere credentials. Then you have to provide the information about uh, vSphere data center and data store. I can show you how it looks like in vSphere. This is the installation I've bought uh, with my 150 bucks VM user group, um, this uh, version of uh, vSphere. I'm using that in my home lab. Here you see the data center and the storage is called data store two. And you have to fill out that in this uh, Terraform variables file. You have to say how much masters, how much workers you want to have um, deployed. You have to provide um, a few more ignition configuration based informations you can leave this to fixed and here you have to provide the um, url of a of a web server where you serve the bootstrap ignition file yeah because as maybe you remember from my slides that um, in the first step um, the bootstrap node um, will fetch its ignition file from somewhere and uh, that's uh, what you have to provide here. You have to provide the location of a web server where the bootstrap ignition file is. I will uh, show you where, uh, how you create that in a few minutes. Then, um, yeah, and here I, you have to, you can provide the MAC addresses of your VMs. The bootstrap VM um, has this MAC address here. Control plane, three masters, three MAC addresses three workers, three MAC addresses for the workers. And that's 
pretty much everything you have to provide here. So that's the uh, uh, most work you have to do. Then we have a folder here, installation dir, install dir. In this folder, you have to provide the uh, ignition files. Um, I downloaded the OpenShift installer from OKD's web page. Uh, maybe you remember it's, if you go to the OpenShift OKD site, you have your releases here on the right. And um, you simply have to choose the installer binary for the version you are interested in. You can download it uh, here. In this case, I would download, um, yeah, maybe it's this OpenShift installer because I'm on Linux, I would download this one. I have done that previously for an older version. And then um, you untar it until you have your installer here. Tells me that is um, the installer for version, OKD version 4.5. That's okay for this demonstration. Afterwards, you have to provide the installer an install config YAML file. Um, I can't show it in detail because my credentials for vSphere are um, in that, but I will copy it in the location where the installer is. If we can show you a template without credentials later. I have configured it for OVN. Okay. Uh, maybe I don't do it in this directory. Let me create a different one. Okay, now we have an install config OVN file. I will replace uh, it to a install config YAML. Okay, the install config YAML uh, contains information like, uh, again, how much workers masters you have, what the domain name is. Um, the, you can provide uh, vSphere credentials. So if you later in your running cluster want uh, to dynamically create more workers, um, you can uh, OpenShift or OKD will use the vSphere API with the credentials provided here in this phase um, to provision more, wor more workers on the fly. Also an autoscaler could um, use uh, the vSphere credentials um, provided here to create more nodes dynamically. The next thing is you have to do this. You have more, um, you have a few um, possibilities what you can do here. I create ignition config files. Also create, um, or um, you also could create the uh, manifests of the cluster operators in this stage and configure them and afterwards build ignition config files from uh, this manifest. That's um, useful if you don't want to create a cluster and configure it afterwards, but if you want to create a cluster that is pre-configured with, um, with your implementation details. This example, I don't do anything like that. I straightforward create my ignition files and here we have the most important one. It's a bootstrap ignition file. We can have a look inside of it. Looks like it's a, a huge JSON file. Sorry, I cannot. Yeah, it's, I think it has 200 kilobyte file size. And we have uh, a few smaller um, ignition files, a master ignition file and a worker ignition file. See, it's much smaller and it uh, almost completely um, uh, contains only a, a certificate, uh, a, a root um, certification authority certificate. It's going from here to here. It's space uh, 64 encoded. 
And that's pretty much everything. What it also contains is the uh, URL um, uh, that points to the load balancer. And I use this port um, 20.22.623. This port is, if you see that, it's always um, the port of the config, um, sorry, ignition configuration server that is running on the bootstrap node and also on the control plane. And from that, um, this small ignition file as that's used for the master VMs uh, will fetch constantly, will pull for an ignition file from the control plane or from, from the bootstrap node in the first phase um, on this path. And it tries and tries and tries to get this um, configuration file um, until it uh, uh, gets it and then it will provision itself. The size of this um, ignition file, um, if it is fetched from the bootstrap, um, VM is much bigger. It's almost the same size as the bootstrap EGN. You see here it's uh, almost uh, 300 kilobyte. And uh, the, the thing is that you cannot provide vSphere uh, very big ignition files. Um, I don't know the exact size it's possible to support a VM in vSphere um, for the ignition files, but it's uh, it's much smaller than uh, what's needed. And um, this two-phase um, ignition fetch is used to overcome this, um, this limit in, in uh, vSphere. Also for the bootstrap VM, we have to use a small stub. It's called append bootstrap. Looks, uh, it's even smaller than the master ignition file. It contains um, the address of a, of a web server. I used Apache, simply Apache web server on this helper node here. And this Apache provides a bootstrap EGN file. I have for that to work, I have to copy. Ignition file to the for www.html folder. I don't do that here, but normally the procedure is uh, like that. And afterwards, I can start Terraform to do its work. See here that I already provisioned VMs with this method. Um, the cluster is already set up. I hope you can read it. Okay, can make it bigger. Here we see um, all the VMs, and this is a running cluster. Yeah, um, it should look like this in the end. If you see a dashboard and what is this? Ah, the samples, okay. It's Don't worry about that. And you have um, normally three green um, check marks, then you are fine. Then you are uh, have your first running um, OKD cluster. I don't know if I should de destroy this one and create a new one. Um, are you interested in that? Because it, it will take a little bit of time, but we could see the initial phase of uh, setting the bootstrap node. Up. Well, that'll happen in the one that I'm going to do for the automation. Ah, okay. So they'll see all the VMs get created and then the okay, great. And stuff like that. Yeah. Because I think um, lots of people are struggling in this first phase mm -hmm. that the bootstrap VM comes up, it gets its uh, bootstrap ignition file, but afterwards uh, things get stuck. Yeah. And maybe it's also interesting how you can f uh, debug that. Jamie, we can maybe do a debug session. Maybe we can produce um, a problem, a mm -hmm. common one, and try to find the solution. Because uh, you will find videos in the internet that show you um, the perfect world. Uh, there are lots of videos uh, for that. But maybe you have um, you can take more about the sessions if you see how to troubleshoot that. Yeah. OK, I will stop screen sharing here. If I find the button, yeah. Okay, Jamie, maybe 
if you like, if you do UPI, can you auto scale workers? Sure, that works perfectly. Uh, you have for that to work, you have to, uh, sorry, I will share again. Okay, I have to get used to this tool here. Okay, I hope you see my screen. Um, for that to work, you have to create um, a machine set, um, how it's called in uh, OpenShift. And the machine set um, has a provider spec where you can say um, OpenShift, um, yeah, which which kind of, of uh, provider you want to use to create machines. I will show you the documentation for that. Here it is. That's the documentation for how to create a machine set on vSphere. And it looks yeah, similar to this section here. Here you have also to provide the information about your vSphere cluster. You can provide disk space, memory of your VMs that are created in vSphere, CPUs, um, and so on. Data center, data store, and so on. And if you provide this machine set to vSphere, you can simply do two things. I, I don't have a machine set up to now. I can try to, but I don't think it will work. Ah, okay. At least we see something. Um, you will see here um, that you can create more machines by simply pressing uh, plus minus. Yeah, and if I would have filled out my vSphere credentials, I would see that if I press save, that vSphere immediately will create new VMs. Um, you have to also to provide a template, a VM template um, uh, for Fedora OS in your machine set. That was one of the fields. Uh, I think it's somewhere. I it should I don't see it, but it's. It's, uh, it should be here, one of these fields. And then um, you will see uh, the face here, the provider state, um, it's taken from vSphere, it says powered on, powered off. Um, then the machine will, uh, Fedora CoS will try to join the cluster. After a few minutes, it goes rather quick. After a few minutes, you will see the machine here, it's unready and a um, few minutes more and uh, you have a ready uh, state on your newly created machine. There are also a few uh, tricks for that. Um, if you want to provide some um, specialties on the newly created workers, um, you have to provide ignition files for that. And there is a, I don't know if it is documented, but I found that in, um, I will show you that. It's rather useful. In the namespace, open machine, uh, open machine, open shift machine. Where is it? Open shift machine API. Where is it? Here is it. You have secrets. You have this master user data and worker user data. And if you look at that, you will see a big, uh, Base 64 encoded string. If you decode it, surprise, surprise, you again see this uh, small ignition stubs, similar to the one uh, we used, we got from the installer. Here you see also the same, exactly same URL. This is uh, here the ignition file. Um, will uh, force a new FCOS machine to constantly pull the ignition config from this URL. Here is a certificate and here you can do whatever you want. I al also um, provided a host name for new, uh, cre newly created machines with this method um, by simply um, setting the host name field somewhere here in the ignition file. You can you can also create services that are talking to um, um, VMware with the VM tools daemon. You can do everything what you want here with the secret. And it's uh, 
in OpenShift Machine API under Secrets. You have two of them, one for the master, one for the worker. Um, but you asked me about automatic uh, creation of machines. Yes, sure, you have an autoscaler. The autoscaler is here under compute. Here it is. Um, per default, you don't have one enabled, but you can create it. You have to tell the autoscaler um, which machine set you want to use. Yeah, machine set, we uh, talked about that a few minutes ago. You have to provide it a name and you say um, how much uh, nodes it is allowed to bring up and what is the minimum uh, node count you are allowed um, uh, to scale down. And also that works pretty, pretty good. Um, there are some specialities, but this, this is not OpenShift related, but more Kubernetes related. If you use resources like, uh, for example, pod disruption budgets, then it can be that um, if the cluster autoscaler tries to uh, delete nodes, that this PDBs, the pod disruption budget, Kubernetes resources are blocking um, the um, eviction of nodes because then you are, uh, um, yeah, are, um, I don't know the English word, are, um, yeah, <laughs> destroying the contract of how much um, pods must run uh, in your deployment. That's exactly what a, PD, what a PDB does. That it defines a minimum a number of pods that always must run. But the autoscaler works pretty good. Um, no, no complaints about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, any more questions before we move on to sort of automating the process? API. And I did put two polls uh, in the polls. There's, uh, uh, are you currently running OKD? And if yes, what version are you running? It'd be interesting to see uh, what folks have um, and uh, be able to get a sense of, of what folks are running. And so now uh, let's talk a little bit about automating the UPI process. So if you're doing UPI, um, you know, as mentioned before, you're going to want to have a proxy um, or a load balancer and possibly a proxy if you're on a private network. And so there's a link to um, some uh, scripts or a script that I wrote. Um, I'll put this in the chat. This is a, a project that I've been working on uh, for a while. Um, it's called OCT and it's basically um, automating the UPI process so that you can continuously um, test OKD cluster installs and, and everything after that that goes with that. Um, and it allows you to do everything from uh, basically generating the ignition config files to um, downloading the version of Fedora Core OS that you want to use as your base operating system on the nodes and running the uh, OpenShift uh, installer. And I've got a list of the prerequisites. I went through these before, but Essentially, you'll want to have your DNS entries that we've talked about uh, for your bootstrap, for your master, for your worker, API, uh, an API int, and uh, for your apps, the wildcard for your, for your apps. And so your load balancer is going to have, uh, uh, basically, you need your um, load balancing to handle the API and ingress. So you'll need two different pools uh, for that. And again, if you're on a private network, um, you're gonna to wanna to use a proxy for outgoing traffic. That's for the installation itself to download the um, uh, containers off of Quay uh, or those for from the testing uh, releases and also for regular operation of your cluster for your pods to do any outgoing traffic like running a yum update or composer install or um, you know, retrieving network resources, uh, resources out on the net. And so Squid is a good one for that. Uh, Squid is something that you can uh, utilize um, pretty easily and configure pretty easily. So let me uh, share my screen here. 
and um, there we go. And so here is the repository for uh, the tool that I um, have been working on, and um, it's OCT, and it's a command line tool to simplify the process of building and destroying OKD clusters in vSphere. Um, this utilizes the um, govc command uh, and the OC and kube control tools uh, that come with OpenShift. So govc is a separate project um, that uh, this tool utilizes, and then also OC and kube control. Um, that are provided with uh, the OKD and uh, OpenShift installs. And so here's the command line arguments. I won't go through all of them, but basically it allows you to, to automate all of the stuff that Joseph was just talking about in terms of having your um, configuration file. And uh, it also has a bunch of extra uh, features. So um, I've got a list of the functions here. Um, for example, the tool checks if you have OC installed, and if you don't have OC installed, uh, it'll pull a version of the tool down um, to your machine, to your working directory, a bin folder in your working directory. And this was mentioned before by Vadim, uh, and I'll expand on it a little bit. The OC binary that you use to manage an OKD cluster can be used to pull down installation tools for different versions. So if you're running a 4.6 cluster uh, and you happen to have the OC tool, you can use that to download the installer and, and um, the OC binary for a particular version like 4.7 or a nightly release and whatnot. And that's something that a lot of folks um, aren't really aware of, but allows you to do uh, testing uh, very efficiently just by pulling uh, the installation tools and the and the relevant OC, and uh, this script also checks if you have uh, the GoVC tool, uh, which is a tool for um, working uh, in the command line remotely or locally uh, with vSphere. So you can create VMs, uh, import uh, templates, OVA templates, and do all sorts of stuff uh, very simply. Um, with the GoVC tool. And so my script works with that. And there's uh, a couple of um, functions within the script that, that do the, the heavy lifting. Uh, the first one is install cluster tools, and that one um, installs OC kube control and the OpenShift installer binary for the version that you want. And then there's one called launch prerun. So launch prerun does the work that, um, you know, when Joseph was talking about, you have that configuration file and the installer um, generates ignition files and then eventually uses those, those uh, the ignition, or generally uh, then the installer, um, uh, you generate those ignition config files and the installer utilizes the SSH um, account that was created, the core account, uh, to go in and trigger the installation and whatnot. Launch prerun um, helps you, it basically generates those files for you and um, modifies them in the way like inserting your, uh, what they call a pull secret. Um, and takes care of doing all that for you. So you, once you've created a template of the config file, this actually copies the template into a fresh one, installs the necessary information that you need, um, and then gets everything set up so that you can do a deployment. And deploy node function in the script actually does the part of generating a VM in vSphere uh, for each of the types of nodes that you need, worker, uh, control plane, and bootstrap, and then inserts the appropriate ignition config uh, into that and can also uh, uh, boot it up. So this is for the individual node this class gets called by the individual node. Build cluster is what calls deploy node. Build cluster basically takes um, all of the information and then calls deploy node for each node that you need. Deploy node can also be used for deploying standalone uh, Fedora Core OS nodes. So if you want to play around with Fedora Core OS, we talked about that a little bit um, in uh, the uh, main 
uh, opening session, uh, this tool can be used to automate that process as well. And then there's destroy cluster, which allows you to very easily uh, tear down your cluster and then manage power, uh, obviously bringing the nodes up or down, uh, and then also uh, clean. So what clean does is it actually cleans up those files um, that uh, we were talking about before um, that uh, you know get generated uh, when you go to do an install, the uh, master ignition, um, metadata JSON file that gets created and all that stuff. So clean will actually clean that stuff up. And so I think what I'll do is uh, actually demonstrate that right now. Um, and then I'll do a destroy and then we'll go from there. So here is a, a cluster that I have running. Uh, it's called Logos. And it's got a uh, uh, bootstrap master, uh, two master nodes, Three, sorry, three master nodes and two worker nodes. And so what I'm gonna do is first off, clean up this mess here uh, that gets created. So uh, call the script and I go clean. And there you go. So now all of those um, files that are created or needed by the installer are removed. And this allows you to, to quickly redeploy Start fresh if you've run into problems. I'm going to delete the bin, which has the installer uh, and OC and Q control as well, just so that we have a, a completely, whoops, completely uh, clean environment here. Okay, so I have um, this append bootstrap uh, and uh, install config template. Uh, and this script is being run on a uh, control uh, on, a, on a machine that I use, an installer machine that has Apache running on it. So for UPI, um, you, uh, if you're doing UPI vSphere, you're often going to be pulling um, the bootstrap script off of a web server. So the web, web server is actually running on this node. Um, but let's first destroy the cluster that I had before. So I'll um, do uh, destroy and then go um, master node count and three and then worker node count is two and um, do that and we'll say logos and whoops what did I miss here uh, oh whoops master node count. There we go. Oh, for some reason it's not working. I'm not sure why, but um, let me see real quick what uh, I missed here. But uh, basically um, you can um, uh, delete um, all of this stuff, uh, or sorry, uh, that's why, destroy and cluster name, I forgot. Okay, so this allows you to work with multiple clusters and I need to put the cluster name. And so we do this, and do that. Okay, and so now uh, you can watch these actually disappear uh, as they get deleted. And this is again using the um, GoVC uh, command line tool to connect to vSphere. Uh, and delete those nodes. Okay, and just takes a second to delete those. And Joseph, let me know if there are any questions uh, in the chat, since I can't see what's going on. Yeah, and um, so now we've got a fresh environment uh, all we have is the append bootstrap, which we can reuse because it doesn't have any unique data in it. Uh, just has the web address and then um, uh, basic uh, uh, parameters. Uh, and then we've got a template here. Uh, that template, I won't cat it out, but basically it's the uh, template that you see uh, in the instructions uh, for an install. If I can find that here. Um, and 
Yeah, it's basically this template uh, with the uh, SSH key and credentials in it. And the script knows to copy that template into a, um, a fresh version of the, of the config file and to utilize that. So I'm going to show you the wrapper script that I created that calls all the different functions um, to do those different stages. So I have a uh, script called build logo. So this is sort of a wrapper script. And as you can see, it calls um, all of the different functions. This allows you, I'm, I'm disabling it right now um, because it just, it's, you're watching, it's like watching paint dry, you're watching the import, but you can import um, from URL into your vSphere the template that you want, the OVA template that you want to use for your OKD install. And you set your basic parameters up here, um, uh, how many masters, workers, the template URL that you wanted to use, um, or the template name if you're going to skip that step, uh, your library within vSphere, uh, your cluster name, and uh, where you want to put uh, that um, uh, uh, cluster uh, in your uh, vSphere, what network it's going to use. So I'm using VM network, the, the default network, and then the, the folder for the installs there. This source is just uh, reading in my credentials uh, for the tasks. Uh, and then again, here's the, imp I've commented this out, but this is importing the template uh, at the library that you wanted. This uh, installs the tools so I'm going to install the tools for a 4.6 uh, OKD installation. Uh, Pre-run and auto secret. This is, um, auto secret is a flag that I created that inserts a sort of dummy secret. And this it prevents you from having to go to the OpenShift uh, portal to get a, a generated um, pull secret. And uh, there's a dummy secret that you use. You don't really lose any functionality uh, by using the dummy secret. Uh, eventually, there is talk in, in OKD of um, utilizing the functionality that um, the um, pull secret provides. Uh, but that's, it's, right now, it's not as, as um, doesn't have as many ramifications of just using the dummy one. And um, here we have the... Uh, uh, the build, a call to the build, where you provide, you know, the cluster folder, cluster name, node count, all of those things that we discussed. Uh, and this is a, a little uh, trick that I, I do so that I can use reserve DHCP. Basically, I have a script that has the MAC addresses, and uh, I call that to set the MAC addresses in all the VMs so that I can use reserve DHCP so I know what the name and the number uh, that the nodes are going to be at, the name and IP number, um, but I'm not doing a static IP installation. It, uh, static IP installation is a little less flexible. And uh, this turns the nodes on, uh, and then this runs the OpenShift installer here. So I'm you know, in my installation folder, and I am going to run that script that we were just looking at, uh, build logos. So I happen to have it in my path and go like this. And so now it's running all of those steps. It's downloading the cluster tools for 4.6. And that'll take just a second. And um, uh, while this is running, I can, I can mention that uh, there's some fe new features I'll be talking about at the end of the session that I'll be adding that make this even more automated. So here it's creating the manifest, which is a step you would manually do in the UPI. Um, it's done that. It's modified the manifest to make sure the control nodes are unschedulable uh, for um, worker uh, pods uh, uh, and um, basically set up the control plane so you don't have to do those manual steps. It copied the bootstrap to my var HTML. Uh, for the web server, and now it's deploying those individual nodes. So as you see uh, here, the bootstrap is getting uh, deployed here. 
And uh, now it's going to go through each one and it's adding again that ignition metadata so that when these are booted up, they will automatically um, start performing their tasks. The boot node, uh, the bootstrap node will automatically start, um, uh, will be available to, for the installer to pull down the uh, initial containers uh, and the worker nodes will be booted and do their um, Fedora Core OS update and then they will restart. So that's a process um, that folks may or may not be familiar with where essentially um, when your nodes first boot up, they install a, the updated version, the most of recent version of Fedora Core OS and then boot into that again. Uh, so you can see all of these nodes are, are getting built and we'll wait just a minute uh, for those to complete. And uh, Joseph. Yeah, your code uh, shows the, uh, the cloud. Um, yes, this, uh, this window, if it starts, so we can see the bootstrap process. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll stay on the bootstrap and then as soon as it powers yeah. up. So it waits until all of the nodes are created before it powers up. Uh, I wrote it that way because there's a flag that basically you can set if you, if you, for example, wanted to build the cluster but not turn it on yet or run the installer yet and whatnot. Um, so it's um, components, it's done as components so that you have the flexibility there. Um, so now we're going to, it'll probably take about two more minutes. So are there any questions at this point or anything yes. that uh, seems unclear? Yeah. So there's a question from Mark Delaney. Do all mm -hmm. of the components get installed into a single data store? Is there any way to assign more than one so that three masters, two workers plus bootstrap aren't all being built on a single data store? So if you're utilizing um, uh, vSphere's, um, uh, but it depends on your vSphere's configured, like it will automatically um, uh, put them in the best place for resources if you have that enabled. You, there's another route that you could do, which my, my script doesn't do that, but you can do this very easily. Um, and actually an old version of my script used to do this, where you can set the, v, the data store uh, on each individual node and it won't make a difference for the cluster. Um, I can share the code with you if you, if you wanna um, share me your email. Uh, was it Mark Delaney? Uh, if you want, share me your email and I'll share, you, share with you the old code that I have that actually does allow you on a per node basis uh, to select your data store. And that is something that some folks might wanna do if, um, for example, they anticipate their workers are gonna have a larger uh, size uh, versus um, your control plane or whatever. Um, so, okay, this is going um, a little bit slower than I hoped. Uh, are there any other questions about this? Here's a question from Larry. Are the sphere role permissions well documented? I suspect that most of these installations are all using full admin accounts. I can assure you, Larry, that we don't have full admin accounts. I think a few of these permissions are documented. Yeah, I believe it is on the, uh, at the very top. And let me see if I can find it. I, I'm pretty sure it is in the top of the vSphere UPI yeah. 4.6. Uh, if it's not, uh, I can find that for you and I'm happy to, to post it um, uh, if you leave some contact. If, actually, we can post it in the blog post. We're gonna be doing a blog post sort of post um, this session. That's, it's a blog post of like all the stuff that we covered in this. And I can put that info if I can't find it real quick quick here. Um, da, 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 da. But we also fall into situations where we had to try it out by trial and error a few times. But we started with uh, OKD 4.2, I think, one and a half year ago. The documentation was not that beautiful it is now. Yeah. So I'll find that for you. I'm sorry, I can't find that right now, uh, what the roles are. Um, hold on one sec here. Oh, 
Okay, so we've got our bootstrap done. Uh, and um, now it is going to power on. To see the ignition yes. fetch. <laughs> but on the masters, we will uh, see it very good. Yes, it'll take a, a bit of time here. Okay, so it's finishing up the workers. And uh, as soon as that's done, we'll be able to see it. Maybe we could SSH into the bootstrap node. Um, I think it's uh, interesting to see what it does. Yeah, well, let's watch the let's watch the bootstrap process first, and we'll see how folks feel about watching uh, things scroll by. But let's uh, let's could you start with the bootstrap? Could you create a snapshot maybe, so we can see it in here in the UI, and afterwards after rolling back. It's a snapshot. Uh, we could SSH into it before we it uh, do that as well. boots the first well, time. Well, let's, yeah, let's, hold on. Okay, so now it's powering all of the nodes up. It's going through. So here's the bootstrap. So here is that first run of the bootstrap node. And uh, it always takes six times on the sixth attempt. Uh, it's able to get the um, ignition config off my server. And now you see it's reading that ignition config in and um, uh, configuring uh, network and all of that stuff. Resizing the disk. And, right, exactly. Okay, so now in the background, um, well, you can see actually here on the screen, uh, it's performing all of the tasks of updating the um, FCOS image. So downloading the latest uh, Fedora Core OS version and um, it's uh, then it, it will reboot um, into the updated version. And actually, let me get a master up. Okay. It's already running. Yeah, so the masters are, are running and they are waiting patiently uh, for the bootstrap to complete. And um, yeah, so this should be going here. Check something real quick. So it's going through that process, and then you'll see it reboot again. And uh, then a couple seconds later, uh, the master nodes will be pulling their their info. And again, this is calling that pool that of um, the master plane uh, that's set up uh, in the F5 that I have. Um, and uh, for for Joseph, it'd be the HA proxy. Yep, here we go, rebooting. Uh, into the latest version. And you can see down here, the installer is waiting for that initial 20 minutes for the bootstrap to start uh, uh, and make itself available. And then once the bootstrap is done in a couple seconds after it reboots and, and turns everything on um, to provide the machine configs, this will change uh, and you'll then see it switch to um, waiting for the control plane for 30 minutes, I think, is the amount of time that does. We won't wait for all of that. But uh, I think you could um, cre uh, use your cube admin password uh, to um, call OC, get pods, all namespaces, so we can watch what it does. That's also possible, I think. It should be possible now. Same we see. The cluster operators, how they, how they get into running state. Okay. 
Mm. Uh, let's see here. I always forget this. Hold on one second. See what this is in. Can set an environment variable. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I have a, a a script that does this. Let me just okay. remember what it is. Um, Jasper is asking about uh, which core OS, which FCOS version you have to use for OKD. Um, it depends, and mm -hmm. I don't think. Uh, normally, you can you can start always with the FCOS version that is mentioned in the OKD version. If you go to uh, the download page, um, I always look at. I, I, I Google for origin CI release, and then the first hit is the page where all um, stable releases of OKD are listed. And if you click on the version, then um, you will see which uh, FCOS version is installed by this version. And you always can start with this version. Right. So if you click on a particular version yeah. like this, um, you can see, uh, um, let's see, where here. is it? Uh, uh, here it is not, this... but normally. Yeah, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Oh, you know what? It's in the Git page is what it is. Um, so if we go to get started and go to releases on there. So it's, it's the releases page on the GitHub you can actually see um, uh, the different components that are there. And that uh, includes the um, OS version that it used um, for, the, um, uh, for the installation. And that is, uh, where is it? I'm not here. sure if it is always, I think it's a uh, room for improvement Sometimes it's up yeah. there. Yeah, on four six, it's uh, four dot six. Uh, normally, normally in almost every release, you see it. There are a few releases recently where it say, uh, did not write it down. Yeah, it's strange because usually they yeah. do have it there. I'm not sure why. Ah, I saw it. Oh, I here saw we go. it. Machine OS. Yes. Yeah. So this is the one you want. Machine OS. And um, was it not? Were we missing it? Or no, it really isn't up there. Okay, that's strange. Okay, yes. Yeah, so machine OS, that tells you what version of Fedora Core OS that it works with. There are some bugs, though, where, like, for example, the most recent version of Fedora Core OS, you don't want to start fresh with that. You want to start with a previous version, um, and that will... Okay, so... Um, and that'll work if you start with a previous version. There's an issue with Podman on the most recent version of Fedora Core OS that it doesn't work with OKD. And we actually have a, um, in the repo, there is a, uh, an issues uh, section um, uh, where you can find um, things along those lines. And there's a known issues um, here uh, let's see if it's in that. No, it's not. But on the blog, there's an article about it, right? I think you put something on the blog um, about that. So as we can see here, the um, installation is now going to um, waiting for the control plane to con to figure configured, um, and we see one is booting up, and if we look at the others, um, those are booting up as well. Yep. Now, so these are going and your workers are still going to be waiting uh, because they won't be able to get anything until the control plane is going. So you'll see this uh, internal uh, server error. And um, if we go here, um, you won't see any nodes yet until they've uh, joined the control plane and the installer is finished. And OK, so now they're rebooting and going to be joining. Yep, so there you go. 
bo booting into the latest version of Fedora Core OS. And then they'll, uh, the etcd uh, cluster uh, will configure itself. Do you have uh, the chance to uh, set the cube config um, environment variable? Oh. Maybe we could have a look. Yeah, I did. So what is then? It's um, OC. I forget that one. Set. You can Let's export see. cube config uppercase to your uh, OS directory. I saw it somewhere. Yeah, I've got it. So I've I've loaded it in, and then um, let's see. It's OC. What's the flag to use it for each command? You, you don't uh, need it. If you set an environment variable, you only simply have to write OC. Well, it is set. Right. But so OC get nodes. Ah. Yeah. So there it, you go. Yeah. Uh, you can go. you do an OC yeah. get pods, all namespaces, maybe in a watch? So we can. Yeah. Uh, which namespace all, would have that by default? All namespaces. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. What is it? All namespaces? All um, hyphen namespaces, two hyphens. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. I think you need two before eight. Yeah. There we go. Yep. So those are all of the operators uh, that are getting installed. And you can also do um, OC get CO, um, which is going to give you the list of those as well. Um, and uh, da -da, let's see where we are in the nodes. Okay, so they are not ready yet, um, but they will soon be joining themselves to the cluster. The first thing is that and, network will set up itself and it's a most critical right. phase normally. And here's a step that I need to automate. I should put this in my script. You will have to approve, uh, once the installation is done, certificates. And those certificates um, the process of, of approving those um, can take a while. And so it's um, kind of handy to have the certificate uh, uh, approval process sort of, um, there it is. You have to approve all the certificates. There won't be any yet, I don't think. The it's, hasn't see, you have to approve the workers. If they start, if the control plane is set up, then uh, the workers will start to um, provision themselves. And after a while, after the first reboot, uh, if Kubelet starts, uh, you will see the CSRs, the certif certificate uh, signing requests. Yeah. And there, there's a handy little um, tool that you can use. Once this is done, um, well, we don't have to wait for it to be done. But, but essentially, you call this um, that will get all of the CSRs uh, and approve them. They added a nice little flag I noticed uh, recently, um, no run if empty uh, in the documentation, which before you would get an error if there were. Ah. So it actually is like, so XRX actually doesn't run if there's if it's a, if it gets a null nice. um, back. So yeah, that is good. So anyway, so this, now we're waiting for the, um, for the install to happen. And um, yeah, are there any questions on, on what we've shown? Have you written the script on your own? It's I love yeah, it. Yeah, I wrote all of this. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's. <laughs> yeah, I wrote this over the period of time, uh, basically about a year and a half, because you know doing the um, installation process over and over and over again for testing. You know, my production cluster has been up. My production, I've got a production um, OCP, a production OKD, and then a testing um, OKD. And rebuilding those um, and having you know disaster recovery, essentially to get them up quickly, I wanted something that simplified the process. And this is the actual script code here. Um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and um, if there's any features that folks would like to see, happy to write those in. And you know, there's a lot of folks doing UPI. Um, so it's, it made sense to me to, to write something like this and share it with the community. There is a question um, from Larry. Uh -huh. Do you use the script for both OKD and OCP? Yes. Yeah, it'll work for both. Um, there's no difference. The only thing is that for OCP, to get that support, you want to have the, the pull secret. 
so in the code, let me, and I, sorry, sorry for like flipping through really fast. I hope I'm not making people dizzy, but um, if you look in my code, where is the pre-run? Right, so basically if you don't add, if you don't say to use the dummy pull secret um, or auto pull secret, as I call it, um, it actually says, please enter your pull secret. Um, so you can um, paste it into a dialogue in the script. So it doesn't make it completely automated. I think what I'm going to do is um, add, add another uh, else to this where it'll read if in your config file, if there is a pull secret already there. And if it is, then it won't. It'll just use that and duplicate it. Pull secrets are good for, what is it, just 24 hours or 48 hours? I can't remember. I think it's 24 hours. Um, the poll secrets are, are good for and I, I don't I think they expire there's a certificate on the other side that expires Jasper is asking you about he's uh, saying awesome work and uh, he has a question he's a bit confused um, why you are not using uh, IPI because uh, sure yeah what's the difference Sh sure so with the reason that um, uh, I'm not using IPI is because we wanted to have the F5. There's a couple of reasons. We wanted to have the F5 as front facing for the cluster because we could then route um, requests uh, uh, through that load balancing and have things such as an, if the cluster in its entirety goes down, still have monitoring notifications, still have redirecting those URLs to uh, outage pages and whatnot. Um, also the ability to use the, um, the other functions that we have in the F5 um, that are a little bit superior to the load balancing within vSphere, if you use the internal load balancing within vSphere. Uh, there's also, um, in terms of IPI, the ability to add um, more network customizations. Um, and uh, also there's um, some uh, benefit uh, to IPI in terms of sort of portability because we have this script and because we have the F5 and whatever, we can duplicate this in other places that maybe aren't necessarily vSphere or don't necessarily um, uh, uh, have, or have slightly different infrastructure and whatnot. Um, so it, not relying on everything being internal to vSphere um, was the way that we wanted to go right now. And also at the time, it wasn't clearly documented. When I first started this, it wasn't clearly documented how to um, set your subnet for your cluster uh, and whatnot. They're, they've added a lot of functionality and a lot of documentation recently about setting your subnets for the cluster and for um, the pod network and stuff like that. A lot of that wasn't clearly uh, defined uh, early on in, in the four releases. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, and it's done. So now it completed in uh, 17 minutes. So now we'll see the workers um, are now booting up. And if we go to here and go um, check, there's no certificates. No, not yet. So we see now that the masters are ready and they're running the most recent version of, um, of uh, 4 6, OKD 4 6, and, uh, and Fedora Core OS. And now the worker nodes are going to come up. That's one thing I didn't mention is, so in your um, call to the script, um, when you put the release version, you can do the whole release version uh, like this, like copy that string for a very particular release version, like from the nightlies or whatever. Or you can just put a major minor um, string like that, like 4.6 or 4.7. And what you'll get back is the most recent version for that major minor release. That's great. Yeah, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, Larry is asking or is saying uh, that he's still uh, confused about 
the cluster API subnets uh, compared to application subnets? Mm -hmm. Sure. So your 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 OpenShift cluster makes calls to a, what are called API. Um, uh, the REST calls to an API address, api.clusterName.domain name. And those map to a pool, whether you do it UPI or IPI, that domain name maps to a pool, load balancing pool, uh, and that can be... Um, a, uh, any subnet, they don't necessarily, I don't think that you necessarily have to have the same subnets um, for, in terms of IP numbers for those, but you want different pools because requests to the API address, um, those are meant for controlling the cluster, um, adding nodes, uh, spinning up pods, and basically cluster management or development tasks. The other subnet is the actual subnet that the pods are running on. And the pool for that, um, to connect to that is another address and that's the apps.clusterName. Dot rest of the domain name. Uh, and that is anytime you spin up a pod, it's gonna have the uh, the, or spin up an application, the application is going to be have a route that is application name or whatever dot apps dot cluster domain name. And you can do mapping to that, but essentially that's a separate load balancing pool. And if you, whether you're doing IPI or UPI, that's a separate load balancer um, because you want it to request to that to go to your different worker nodes to handle requests for the actual applications. Does that explain it and answer the question there? No answer. Okay, we'll see. Um, so now we see uh, when we do get nodes, those are ready. Um, we're gonna check for certificates, none yet, because the, the workers are still sort of rebooting into the OS sort of, uh, they are. Uh, rebooting right now. Ah, yeah, here we go. So worker nodes are now switching into the new version of FCOS. And you'll see that there's some certificate requests that need to be approved. And then once that happens, the worker nodes are added. And was there a response on uh, if my answer um, made things clear or did it make it muddier? With the, net, with the subnet, um, Larry is answering, yeah. I think so. Okay. So it's pools, basically. There's two different pools, and those may or may not necessarily map to different IP subnets, but it's different pools for different tasks. Okay, so now this is up, and there we go. We just approved the CSRs for the two worker nodes. And where's the other one? There we go. And then there's another one, another set of certificates that'll pop up. Uh, and there they are again, I just approved them. So now if we do get nodes, um, in a couple of seconds, usually in about a minute, uh, the worker nodes are then uh, available. Here they are. So with, yeah, so with a, um, with the script and, uh, 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 you know, in just a couple of, of clicks, if you wait patiently to approve the CSRs, within an hour, you can have uh, an open uh, an OKD cluster running, and uh, so let's do uh, get nodes up. Still not quite yet. Um, any questions about any of this? I hope this was helpful. The thing is that you can customize lots of uh, of everything uh, with UPI. Yeah, you can export all uh, YAML manifests um, right with the installer, you can patch everything and create um, with the installer from the patched manifests, uh, the ignition files, so that your cluster right from the start is uh, completely pre-configured. And that's, I think it's it, it's not uh, possible with IPI. Right. 
And oh, here we go. Uh, we've got one ready, and I bet when this returns, the other one will be ready. And we will have a working cluster. Now, it's going to take some time. If you do OC get CO, you'll see that the machine operators are not done yet. There's still one that needs to finish here. And uh, ingress always needs to finish and monitoring. That will happen over a period of a few minutes. They are um, getting configured right now. Um, Larry, le and, sorry? Yeah. No, uh, Larry, uh, see, you have only have to uh, um, sign the certificate during the first installation. Um, if you, that's, I, un, I have also asked why they do that. Because they say it's because of security uh, reasons that they don't uh, want to have uh, Fedora Core as machines uh, wildly joining an existing cluster and it takes everything uh, what comes and uh, joins it. Right. Uh, but if yeah. you, um, as I uh, told earlier, if you use machine sets in a running cluster, then the approval of new machines is done automatically. If if you mean that with automatic cert signing, Larry. Right. Yeah. Do you have any examples of manifests patching via ignition files? We can show that maybe in a in a separate uh, directory. So if we go, well, here's an example. Here's a, a brief one. Um, so if we actually go to the code of, uh, oh yeah, right in pre-run. So here's, here's an example of some things happening in terms of manifests. So there's a manifest that gets created um, when you run the gener the create manifest you, call from the open. Could you zoom a little bit? It's a little bit, it's very small. That? Yeah, it's better? better. Thank you. Okay, great. Yes. Um, so that is, there's, when I do, when you do create manifests, there's some manifests that actually need to get deleted uh, for UPI. And so in my script, I actually delete the ones that need to get deleted. Um, and then there's also uh, one that needs to get changed. This mm -hmm. one here, cluster scheduler, needs to have um, the, the part where it says is, are the masters schedulable for pods like application pods and to say that as no you change that to false and that's something that you want to do on a on a standard uh install. could you do that in a in a directory um uh do i have any op i don't uh you only need an uh, install config yaml file yeah so and the uh, directory uh, an empty directory for that Oh, you know what? When you run the when you run the the installer, it deletes the OpenShift directory, um, uh, the manifests yeah. and stuff. So it also see. consumes the install config YAML file. Yeah, it for does. For any reason. Um, yeah. <laughs> so here's here's what I can do. Um, let me do uh, use the, my tool to do this quickly. Uh, OCT. Um, yeah, but I'll do this. Let's do this. Clean. Okay, and my oh, bin is still we there. Need the authentication. I'm gonna. I'm keeping ah, okay. that. Cool. Because if I do, um, <laughs> if I do create manifest, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Let me do cp off. So off. Backup. Okay. Larry asks. Oh, I, I actually accidentally deleted the auth. Sorry. So, um, but um, in short, uh, yeah, you basically it's it's uh, XML or sorry, um, JSON um, or YAML uh, files uh, for the manifests, uh, and you basically just change the YAML for them. You have uh, some credentials to log in, or is it lost? Um. Well, I can do, uh, um, it's, is it still loaded? No, it's not still loaded. So I lost that. Um, but, uh, in, it, it, you know, the, the YAML files are standard YAML files, as you would expect. And the modifications, um, 
are pretty matter of fact they even cover some modifications that you can do in at the bottom of the let's see you will this you will get a directory with lots of yaml files they are numbered from zero to yeah. whatever and the lower the number the earlier uh, normally uh, the manifests are applied to the cluster yeah oh but did i did i destroy your cluster it's my fault no 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 no. that's that's it's it's all it is is the um the uh the password the access has gone but that's fine i, I can re redo it um so installing the short term users uh, user uh, where is the yeah it is this one but basically at the end there's um, examples, I thought it was this one, of like creating all sorts of modifications to your um, config files to do things on install, like, um, what, was the, what was the example that they give? Oh, setting your NTP server. So there's an example of using a uh, config to um, set the NTP server on the nodes when they boot up. And things like that. So it's it's there's a lot of examples in the documentation for that. I think the cluster operators should be ready. I have a strong feeling. Well, I I lost the uh, the config stuff when I cleaned. Ah, okay, that that was a meant. But, uh, ah, okay. Yeah, but. Um, it may or may not have been because I've noticed that it can take a long time. So I don't think we want people to sit through that. Um, so any other questions? Let me stop screen sharing here. And um, that there we go and joseph if you want to log in and show your stuff because you've got some stuff that's up. yes i can show an upgrade yeah. um yes so i um have to take a look first um here it is. Okay. Um, after the first installation, I'm on OKD 4.5. I have uh, a default machine set. I always deleted. This one is from a question someone t uh, asked me. So it's not really a useful machine set. Okay. You should normally start um, an upgrade if nothing is degraded. In this example, I think the OpenShift samples operator in the older versions of OKD um, sometimes gets degraded, but um, the upgrade will should succeed nevertheless. Yeah, and I will do an upgrade now. I go to I can, um, if you have an internet connection like I have um, you can choose the next version you are, can upgrade to. In my um, case, I'm able to um, go directly to version 4.6. I will choose that, this one. Uh, first, there was, a, there was a problem with OKD 4.5. I have to check something. I will SSH into one of the masters. and check something. I will write a blog article on OKDAO about that. If someone is uh, still at the old version, you will need that. I hope I don't. Ah, sorry. Scrolling is, uh... yeah, no, everything is fine. I can upgrade. Um, 
on OKD 4.5, some repositories on the Fedora code, uh, Core OS nodes were enabled. And if you upgrade during the upgrade process, then it, if the repos are enabled, it tries to pull images, uh, packages, sorry, from the internet, which sometimes could be a problem. So you have to disable them uh, before you upgrade. Yes, all repos are disabled. Now I can go straight to my update button and then I switch to overview. You see here that it tells me that the cluster is working towards a new newer version. Currently we are at 4.5 from last year. If you want to see more, you can go to cluster operators. I always I always sort Okay, it has not downloaded anything. It will take a little bit. It takes a little bit. I can see here that it's creating a new cluster version operator, a new version. Okay, it's done. And this should be the first operator that gets updated. So if I go to cluster operators and sort the version, no, it's still not here. It takes a little bit. One person. Let's give him a few minutes. What it does is that it downloads this a new version of this cluster version operator and the cluster version operator contains um, all manifests of all operators um, that have to be updated, upgraded. And um, it updates one operator after another. Yeah, in, in, a, in a certain order that, uh, yeah, um, starting with the API server and the last thing uh, that gets upgraded is the OpenShift mach uh, machine. Where is it? Uh, something operator. Where is it? OpenShift. The machine config operator is the last one. And this operator um, upgrades the operating system at the very end. Um, in this situation, um, you will see that always one master and one worker um, get uh, are getting unschedulable and the nodes were automatically drained and then new a new OS version is applied and um, the system automatically boots into the new Fedora Core OS version. In this case I have Fedora Core OS 32 released last year in June and after the nodes are upgraded we will see that we have a Fedora Core OS version 33 from I think January as uh, this year and you have to do nothing it's uh, running completely on its own let's have a look on the operators now 11 percent okay the first operator is already on a new newer version it's a etcd operator. Now you can have a look what it does. Okay, it's, it's already over. It's uh, upgrading, it's uh, installing a new version of etcd and automatically does um, the migration from the old etcd to the new version. You can have a look. Yeah, if it, if you do it like, if you watch it like I do here, that always if something pops up, you will see all the uh, pods that are spawned to do the upgrade. Here we see a new etcd. Some quorum guards are created. The cube API server operator was uh, upgraded and now upgrades one API pod after the other. Yes, this is the cube API server operator. If you 
as I always switch back and forth between overview to see which pods are, um, what's the state of the pods is here are six. Okay, it, I do it just for interest. Normally you can leave it alone. Cluster operators, let's have a look what happens here. ETCD is still updating. It should be here. You see in the right column, you see that two nodes. It, he's talking about masters here. Two masters are already on a newer revision. What does a revision mean? A revision means it's a new, a new state. Yeah, it's not really uh, that. Uh, it does not really mean that this etcd is of version four or an image and Docker image with tag four. No, it means that something has changed. Also, if you delete an etcd pod, you will see that it's upgrading. Yeah, because uh, the operator always tries to um, get to its desired state. And if um, even if it's not upgrading, but only uh, getting to its desired state, you will see that it's get an, getting a new version. Yeah, now we have three nodes. Sorry. We have a question yep. from uh, Jesper. Jesper says, when you have installed with UPI and have the vSphere template and credentials specified in the machine set, mm -hmm. as talked about previously for scaling, would it roll VMs or would it upgrade the existing VMs? Um, it will um, create VMs uh, with the new, um, a good question. I have to think about that. I think it will at first it will create a version with um, the older OS version and if this one is created and has joined the cluster it will do automatically an upgrade to the target um, OS version so in the end all nodes have the same version regardless of uh, where you started does that answer your question Jesper So are you, let me ask this, are you asking if new nodes, so a machine set can be used, a machine set is used at two different times. It's used for the initial building of the cluster and then also um, for adding nodes and applying to it. So if if you're applying and adding new nodes, those new nodes will brought up to the, be brought up to the same across the machine set. And it, it would be new VMs. It, so that's it only, why you have your credentials yes. for vSphere and whatnot. Yeah. You always get new VMs. And uh, the old ones are not... If you have a newer version of a template, then the old versions, the old VMs will um, still run in the cluster. Because, uh, yeah, you would disrupt. You would disrupt the cluster in that case. But if you upgrade the cluster on its own, normally all um, VMs get upgraded. As I, and Jesper says, as I understand for IPI, then upgrades or when upgrades happen by creating new VMs, and if they join successfully, the old VM will evict containers and then it will spin up containers in the new VM and continue. Good question. I, I don't think so. I think um, for IPI, it's it's the same that, so if you're updating the OS, it's rebooting that same VM with the new um, OS and any new changes from the machine config. Uh, it's it's not spinning up a new VM, I, th I don't think, in IPI. I, I don't think so. Yeah. No. So this will take some time. I don't think that we... Yep, yeah, um, can wait about that, can wait for that. Yeah. But one trick is, uh, in the end, uh, it takes uh, rather long after all VMs are upgraded. Uh, you can set how much nodes are upgraded in parallel. Yeah, the default is one, always one master and one worker, but, but you can increase this number and then the upgrade will um, advance more, f uh, much faster. This is, oh, this is I did. Hmm? I did regenerate uh, my YAML configs. So, ah. um, 
just to get folks, uh, if you want to stop sharing, and then I'll go ahead and share. Yeah, sure. Just to show folks yeah, what sure. this looks like. Okay. It's hard to, am I sharing? Yes. Let's see. Yes. Okay. I see good. your screen. All right. Now going here. So this is, um, there's a step where when you create the ignition config files, it then deletes this folder called OpenShift uh, and this folder called manifests. And if you look in the documentation, whoops, I'll put a, um, a link to uh, the part that talks about just had it. Um, yeah, here we go. So in this section on installation um, boom, customization, there's examples of creating these YAML configuration files that will then get uh, put into the nodes, um, these manifests that'll then get put into the nodes for things such as disk encryption for um, uh, crony, configuring crony to use a particular NCP server and anything that you can think of. So this is actually factors into why I was encouraging folks to familiarize themselves with Fedora Core OS. Fedora Core OS does everything through manifests, um, uh, or I should say everything through ignition config. Uh, and so you, you create a YAML file that's um, similar to a manifest, uh, and you put it through a um, tool that they have, and then it creates the JSON-based uh, ignition config. Uh, and then you apply that to a Fedora Core OS node, and all of these things that we're talking about um, and a lot of stuff of the OS can actually be configured through these. So if we go down here, um, this is at, like pre-creating the ignition configs. Here's the manifests. So if you go to manifests, um, these are the manifests that go into creating the ignition config. And an example of, of a modification is um, I found that my nodes were timing out, my worker nodes were timing out when trying to connect to the control plane uh, when they would first uh, uh, boot up. Okay. And, and, and I think we, we talked about this yep, yep. a little bit in the channel. So what I found is if you modify um, in the master and worker IGNs, uh, a timeout value. Ah, uh, yeah, you do that. Okay, nice. So let's see, which one is it? It's in the OpenShift. Um, there we go. Oh no, actually, it's in the. It's I have to actually. You can't do it in the manifest. You have to do it actually in the in the ignition that gets generated after. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm not sure why, um, uh, but basically you can modify uh, the timeouts that the nodes have when trying to connect to. Um, machine config from the API server. I can, I can show uh, something similar if you have a running cluster with the machine configs. I don't know um, if everybody uh, knows that. Yeah, I, we lo we use that a lot. Jamie, or, Here, or do you, you want, want to, go to... Ahead and log into yours? Yeah. You got yours. You want to log into your stuff? I'll stop sharing. So. It it would be nice. We can switch yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Now we have a we have a workflow. <laughs> okay, so do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so here we have one of the coolest features um, that has to do with uh, CoreOS. These are the machine configs. Under Compute Machine Configs, you find yeah uh, some uh, manifests that are telling uh, OpenShift or OKD um, what you want to configure on your host. Yeah, formally, if you wanted to install something or write a file or change a file, you had to SSH into the node on OKD3. It was uh, very common uh, to use Ansible to uh, change something on all nodes. 
you don't have to do that anymore with uh, Fedora or Red Hat Core OS. You can almost change everything with machine config manifests. Let me show you an example. I am searching some random. Yeah, here we have an example. Let's fold that away. This is a machine config. It's uh, applying configuration to all workers. Like you can set the role here. You can also uh, do it on, on single workers if you want. You have just have to label them. Then you have a spec field. This spec field, in fact, is an ignition, has an upsala, has an ignition structure. And here in the storage section, I can say, come on, uh, write this base64 encoded whatever content into this file in this pass. Yeah, and the user uh, to use uh, for the file, the permission is uh, user ID is root. So if I decode that, I don't know what that is. Yeah. yeah, it's some, yeah, I don't know what this is. It's a content of a file. And if you apply that uh, machine config here, it's only a short ignition snippet. Yeah, you can, can write everywhere on the host where you have read write permissions. Normally, I think um, ETC and uh, the other one was the var, I think the var folder. You can write into it with this method and was, um, and what happens then if you apply that is that you get, I will sort the date here, you will get uh, a new render file. Yeah, we have here a rendered worker and a rendered master file. And uh, I always sort it to the date because I, every time you apply something here, you will get a new rendered file. This um, files contain all configurations the base configurations and the ones here, the additional ones, um, they are merged together in one big ignition file. Let's have a look into it. Here you see we have the SSH, um, some SSH files. We have lots of files that are written with content lots of lots of stuff in fact it is a ignition file that is served to new or existing um, fedora core as nodes yeah you see that it's a long list somewhere here um, you can also find uh, system d services they are not base 64 encoded you can create your own system D services. Sometimes you need that. You see lots of services. What is this? So this is a hypercube service. Yeah, and you can change what new nodes will see um, by applying machine config uh, objects. One thing we have done in my company is we wanted uh, we have an an air gapped cluster and we wanted uh, wanted to uh, pull the images not from the internet but from our internal registry our internal registry let's say we have a name something like that something like that blah 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 name of the image so if i want to have if i want to use that um i could use some some proxy i could patch all my manifests to use this registry which is uh, awful or you could use um, a mechanism of podman and this mechanism works like this I will open a terminal on the host. 
normally you never have to go to with SSH to your nodes. You can use this me mechanism here. It's upgrading. So I have a terminal now. Now I'm in a, I will enter a change root command. And now I'm on the host. Yeah, I'm not using SSH to go to the, my, my master zero. I'm using this method here. I'm now on the host. Oops, it's upgrading. Bad example. And what we have done is to change this file here, etc containers registry conf. This is a configuration file for Podman, where you tell Podman um, which mirrors you use. And we have bent. This is a very short one. I think during the installation we will get more information here. It always kicks me out. You can tell Popman to um, add always if you if someone wants to pull an image from Quay or from um, Docker IO or whatever that it in 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 uh, in fact should go to a different registry and this process is completely trans transparent. Yeah, so in this um, this way with this Podman file configuration file you can tell Podman to in fact pull images from a completely different registry than the one that was addressed in the in the manifest. And we write this file um, with machine configs. Now you maybe you ask, yeah, but uh, sorry, but um, during the cluster in, um, installation. Um, um, this file will be overwritten. How do you control um, that at the very end of the cluster installation, this file has to be written? This can be done uh, with these numbers. If you apply a machine config with a, a, high, a higher number, then these uh, configs will be applied later in the process. And the lower the number, the earlier configuration will be applied. Yeah, that's uh, some, uh, it's a kind of priority, prioritization you can do here. And we have done lots, lots of configurations this way on the host. And um, we absolutely not use Ansible for changing uh, existing clusters. You, we not even have to go um, to nodes with SSH because you know, normally you don't have to do that. If you want to change your kubelet parameters, uh, I think you even have an, a configuration object for that. Kubelet config. I I don't I don't know, but I've seen that uh, previously. You can change everything with custom resources or or other configuration mechanisms in OpenShift and OKD. That's what I love about this uh, Fedora core thing that you can control everything with uh, Kubernetes manifests or ignition files. Okay, that's uh, what I wanted to show. I can I can show the progress. Let me see how far our configuration. We are at seventy fourteen percent. How much operators are left? Oh, it's it has a little bit to do. Okay, we will come back if it is upgrading the, uh, the machine nodes. config is always the last yeah. uh, operator uh, to do that. So That's we have true. any more questions uh, from folks? Hey guys, Hi. how are you Hi doing? Dan. It looks it looks like you're you're getting there. Yes, it's running fine. Oh, I, I forced, I closed something and uh, he deleted his credentials because of me. <laughs> it's not That's supposed right. to work this it. way. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. All right. So it, from the, the folks who are listening in, um, I, I hope this has been this is still really helpful. It's I think it's great that we've got these two guys here doing this. Uh, are there other 
um, things that you would like to see us um, document better? Um, are there, have they gotten it? I can see some of the questions in the chat. Um, are those things that we should be updating in, in the documentation guide? Yes. Are there a, some notes based on some of the things that people have asked because some of the things are stuff that should be addressed i think in our documentation and if yeah. not then in the actual okd itself documentation for sure yeah i know because in a couple of the other sessions um there are things that are just in in the openship documentation that are as clear as mud too so um it, it may be a, a thing that we end up with better documentation in okd um and then uh, kind of move some stuff there. So, yeah, so Larry, if you find those references, um, whether they're in the OpenShift docs or OKD, just log an issue or make a pull request against that chunk, um, and we will make sure that we get it merged and, and get it in. We're really trying um, hard um, to get other, other, other eyeballs on this documentation. Um, Help with doing that process if you're not familiar with which repo or whatever feel free to reach out to any of us. We can direct yeah. you to the right place and, and help yeah. you out. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely um, game for um, even grammar checkers um, are, are friends of mine because um, as you know, we all are, um, I type too fast, other people English is a second language. And um, uh, if, we, if the documentation was Auf Deutsch, Joseph, you'd be rocking it. Um, it ain't. <laughs> and, uh, so we've got some some issues with that. So um, we're, we're doing pretty good, I think, so far. But uh, we have a couple more stubs, I think, from the Home Labs group um, that we're probably going to get put in. Make Vadim put a stub in for his and Craig for his and Shri for his. Um, but the Home Labs are pretty tricky because it's really specific to people's um, what they have for hardware. Yeah. But they're still helpful. So. So how, far, how far along are you? Are you just waiting for something to complete? Yeah, I think we're wrapping up unless folks have any more questions. I, we've covered a lot of ground and got some great questions. And um, this was great. I had a great time. Cool. Um, Jesper's asking another question of Joseph. He's on a blog about newish Quay feature for transferring images to offline networks. Um, do you have a link, Jesper, to that blog post? Mm. Do you mean mirroring? Feature. As this mirroring was not a feature, feature, but more a workaround uh, for a bug. Um, you don't, uh, if I don't know what you mean, you wish Quay feature for transferring images. Yeah. Mm. No, uh, Jesper, I think what you mean if I'm correct, uh, if I understand it correct, is that there is a, there is a bug that um, affected one of the core libraries that um, have to do with uh, Docker images. And uh, this library is used, yeah, this library is used by lots of tools, by Scopio, by Podman, by whatever. And uh, because of this bug, um, it, it's a bug exists since a long time and it occurred on Quay and uh, it led to that the wrong image manifest. Uh, it's written in a wrong version and that therefore um, um, online, um, sorry, company mirrors, um, company registries uh, were refusing to store these images and uh, more and more images also the OpenShift and OKD ones, uh, sorry, OKD ones were affected. And um, in my company, the uh, registry refused to store the image we could, could mirror. But in the end, uh, two things happened as uh, this problem was fixed. And I had uh, help with a few guys that showed us how to convert the image so they are working again. And the third thing is I could uh, turn off the switch in my registry that refuses to store the uh, image. So in the end, it was not so bad at all, but it's, I would not call it a feature. It uh, was more a bug. Yeah, it could get turned into a feature. 
and product knowledge, then we could sell it back to somebody. I don't know. But but anyways, uh, if uh, if if you're still if you're waiting for something to complete, is that in the background yeah. or yes, um, we are still waiting for an upgrade to finish, so that we sh can show the OS upgrade. It will. I don't know when it will start. It can take ten minutes, maybe. Well, okay. let's let's uh, people know it'll be what it'll be like at the end. Maybe we not make people sit through another ten, ten minutes. minutes if we. Yeah. No, sure. Yeah, I think it's it's been it's been kind of a long day, um, yeah. and um, we believe you that the upgrade will work. Um, and uh, even though the time left says five hours, I just did that in case somebody wanted to do a complete live deploy somewhere on the hardware, so you're not obliged to stay another five hours because I know you can see the timer at the top <laughs> in the background. Um, but if you're if you guys don't have any more questions um, and anyone else. Um, Next up, um, we're going to try and do these things quarterly. I think that it feels good, um, feels right to do this. Um, so, Larry, your team, chess, this is a chess game, your checkmate here, your team is on the hook for doing some sort of deployment demo um, next up. And Jesper, we'll, we'll get you in on a Saturday since Saturday is better for you. I don't know what time it is where you are. I think you're in Finland or someplace like that. So, um We'll, we'll make you guys do some of the demos too and um, uh, maybe have fireside chats as well. So I wanted to really thank both Joseph and Jamie. Jamie, especially for getting in the background and um, helping with organizing stuff this week while I had some family stuff going on. So that was really wonderful to have my back. And Joseph, for all the work you do around um, getting the blog post done, it's getting late there. Um, and it's a Saturday and I know you guys took all the time to make this happen. So thank you very much.